I'm going to talk about clustering data, a guide for the perplexed. So I'm John Healy. Uh, this is Leland McInnes. We're both mathematicians and researchers from the Tut Institute for Mathematics and Computing in Ottawa, Canada. You can get to us on Gmail. Our addresses are right there. So let's start off. What is clustering? So clustering sounds straightforward. We find groups of data that are all similar. Easy to say, a little bit hard to do, and it tends to mean different things to different people. So over the course of this talk, we're going to make that a little bit of a more concrete statement. So what it means typically depends on your application. So there are lots of goals that people might use clustering to do. You might want to use to partition your data. Say you're on a, an HPC or a distributed computing system and you want all of your data to live on a separate drive or in a separate location, then you need to partition it and probably want balanced partitions across that space. Maybe you want to summarize your data. You want to explore your data. You want to embed it into a vector space so you can use other machine learning algorithms. You want to find patterns within your data. Lots of different reasons to cluster, which lead to lots of different clustering definitions. So the keys there where we find groups of data that are similar. How do you define groups and how do you define similar? So if you're partitioning, you've got some pretty hard constraints and you want it across that they're balanced and that's maybe more important than the fact that everything within each cluster or partition is exactly the same. So that's easy in theory, that's hard in practice. We're going to walk through some examples of what common clustering algorithms do on a two-dimensional data set. So two-dimensional data, human eye is really good at clustering. We can look at that and go, I know what those clusters are. I'm done. No problems. This will this allow your intuition to jive with what the algorithms are doing. You've been looking at this for a few minutes. You probably already know what the clusters are. So let's move off and look at k-means. It's the first algorithm everyone learns. It's one of the most obvious. Great. That's probably not what most of you were thinking when you looked at this data of what the clusters are. Um, so what k-means is doing is it's throwing k-centers down in your space and then it's iteratively moving them around your space to minimize intra-cluster distance and maximize inter-cluster distance. So that's got a couple of disadvantages. The one everyone knows is you have to choose k. Like, oh, I have to pick my number of centers. What if I don't know how to pick my number of centers? That's a little hard to do. There's some work you can do to work around that. A slightly more subtle disadvantage is that it's a centroid-based technique. So at the end of the day, every point got allocated to the center that was closest to it. And that's a Gaussian ball assumption. That's saying, my clusters are sphericals. So now, spherical clusters might exist for some data. They probably don't exist for the general concept of data. And assuming that all of your data is spherical is kind of like assuming spherical cows. Not a great idea in general. <laughs> Lastly, we've allocated every single point to a cluster. So this is the assumption that you're partitioning instead of clustering. So that's saying, hey, there is no noise. There is no background. All of my data is clean and lovely. This is taking a square peg and hammering it into a round hole. So let's move on and look at something else. Affinity propagation looks surprisingly similar to k-means. There's a reason for that. It's the last step of affinity propagation is going to be one iteration of k-means. But affinity propagation is kind of interesting in that every point is going to vote on the exemplar or center that they feel best represents them. This is kind of a cool idea. It allows you to get non-symmetric similarity measures. I, my, my similarity to you can be different than your similarity to me. That's a really nice feature. It, and you don't have to choose the number of clusters. The disadvantage is there's another parameter that you do have to tweak. The results are very similar, sim, um, very sensitive to that other parameter. The other disadvantage is it's slow, and the final disadvantage is you ran k-means at the end, which means spherical cows, square pegs. They came right back in, you partitioned, and you've got these spherical clusters. Okay, moving on. Mean shift. Mean shift's an interesting algorithm. You're going to initialize your space with k centroids. And then you're going to sort of estimate the local density around your space, and each of those centroids is going to do a hill climb to the local maxima. So you're going to find these modes or regions of high density. Then you're going to allocate every or uh, the points that are dense and near it to that cluster. So one advantage is that you get those black points. So those are the points in the low density areas. So you say, hey, I got noise. I'm not going to assume that all of my data has to be dense or has to be within a cluster, which is great. I got rid of my square peg. Unfortunately, I still have 
my spherical cow assumption. So I have balls in my space. All right, we are on Birch. You the spectral. I did? Yeah. Awesome. Spectral clustering instead then. Spectral clustering is nice. Um, spectral clustering says, hey, I've got really high dimensional data, but maybe it lives on a low dimensional manifold. Now think of that as like a two dimensional surface floating through, let's say a three dimensional space. If I'm gonna compute distances there, maybe I don't wanna compute them in the three dimensional space. I wanna talk about them moving along this surface. So to do that, we'll typically approximate our data with a K nearest neighbor graph, and then have my distances moving along the graph. And so we'll look at the adjacency matrix of that, use a little bit of linear algebra, embed that into a low dimensional vector space, and perform our clustering on, in that low dimensional space. The issue there is typically what people do in that low dimensional space is run k means and enter spherical cows and the square pegs. Birch. Balanced iterative reducing and clustering using hierarchies. Okay, so what Birch is gonna do is it's going to iteratively partition your data up into this sort of uh, tree. It's a cluster feature tree. Think of it sort of like a B plus tree that's, that's sort of dynamically being updated and growing. And now, once we've broken our, our data up into these trees, we're gonna look at the leaves of the trees. The leaves of the trees represent sort of groupings of your data. We're gonna put tiny spherical cows around each of the, those leaves. Then we're going to run another clustering algorithm, usually k-means, to cluster the spherical cows into large spherical cows. And this is what you get. On the advantage, it's fast, it's got low memory, uh, a low memory consumption, it's streaming, and you don't have to specify the number of clusters. It does have a parameter that's a little bit hard to tweak. Okay, enough of centroid-based clustering algorithms. I think we're all seeing a recurrent theme of spherical cows coming across here. <laughs> All right, hierarchical clustering, or we're gonna talk about specifically agglomerative clustering. This is where you say, all right, I'm gonna take all of my data points, I'm gonna take the two nearest ones, merge them together. And I'm just gonna repeat that over and over again. Now to do that meaningfully, I have to come up with some definition of distance between groups of points. So however you define that distance between groups of points is going to define what kind of clusters you're looking for. So single linkage clusters, clustering will allow you to get these long, um, spindly, snake-like clusters coming out. Complete linkage clustering is going to get us spherical cow clusters coming out. Ward is sort of a statistical method that generates statistically spherical cows. The advantages of this is that some of the methods don't constrain the shape of your clusters, which is kind of nice. You might not have spherical cows, that's great. The other is you don't need to select K. K. So this gives you all possible K in a dendrogram or a large tree. So it has lots of hierarchical information about how your clusters merge and split, and that's great. If you have more than a few thousand points, that dendrogram looks horrible. It's a black mess if anyone's ever tried to do that in Python and or R. And choosing the cut at that tree, which is akin to choosing your number of clusters, can be quite difficult to do. That being said, if you've got smaller medium amounts of data and you think there's a lot of hierarchical structure within your data, this is an excellent technique to choose. All right, DB scan is the last of the, the algorithms I'll talk about it quickly. It's a density-based clustering algorithm. It tries to find regions of your space that are dense, uh, surrounded by regions of space that are not dense. So the way, the way they're gonna do that is they're gonna put balls of a fixed size around every one of your points, count the number of other points that are contained within the ball. That's gonna be how dense the local region of that individual point is. And now I'm just gonna look for contiguous regions of very dense points. So that allows me to have these gray and black points in the background because they're outliers, they're not contained with any of these dense regions. It also allows me to have uh, arbitrarily shaped clusters of these dense regions. You still have a parameter, a couple of parameters to choose from. One is that size of that ball that you need to do a lot of work to adjust over to find quote unquote right solution. So here you see we've merged some clusters that we probably shouldn't have. Uh, but overall, it looks fairly good. Now, we've done all of these searching and the parameter searching seems to have come up repeatedly, and that's easy-ish to do in a low dimensional space, and that's gonna get harder to do when you can't visualize your data and look at them. So, what makes this all so hard? All right, what makes a good clustering good? How do you tell? So, there's lots of different measures for goodness of clustering that are out there. Uh, Christian Hennig 
gave a great talk at PyData London 2016. Highly recommend you all go out and look at it. You could look at intercluster separation, intercluster homogeneity, you could look at density, you could look at uniform cluster sizes, lots and lots of different things. There's probably a different goodness measure for every clustering algorithm out there, and then you publish the paper that shows that you're better than everyone else via your distance measure. It's a good secret. Um, what a good clustering algorithm is and what a good measure is depends on what your algorithm needs, what you need for your application. All right, so here's uh, some slides that are straight stolen from Christian Hennig's talk. And this is uh, the best possible three clustering if you're trying to minimize intra-cluster distance. So you can look at that and some of you will say, yes, that's the best clustering. That's exactly what I want my clustering to be doing. Via a different distance measure, that's the best clustering. So, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but for everyone in the room, you need to decide which one you liked better and then figure out why you liked it better for your application. I happen to like this one better, and I'll go into that in a little more detail soon. All right, what is a cluster? Well, what do I mean by cluster? That's maybe an easier question to answer. I tend to use clustering for doing EDA or finding interesting regions in my data, exploring my data, summarizing what my data sort of contains. So I have a particular application in mind when I talk about this. You will probably have a different one yourself. Let's start looking at what I don't want to do. Not a surprise, we have these spherical clusters. Your clusters don't need to be balls. Straight up, spherical cows, they don't need it. Spectral clustering, you can see this region in the bottom right corner? Those are all clusters, that's all one red cluster. So this is the partitioning problem again. Not every point in your, in your data needs to be in a cluster. Real data has noise. We've got measurement error, we've got sampling error, we have plain old data corruption. Lots of things can, can make this change. One of your applications might be partitioning, but if that's not an explicit requirement of your application, you probably shouldn't use a square peg, assu peg assumption. All right, this was the best of the bunch for my definition. What was their definition of clustering? All right, clusters are dense areas separated by less dense areas. All right, I, I can't think of another really good notion that jives with mine very well, but everyone's data is special, unique, just like every snowflake. That's what I mean when I talk about clustering. You should think really hard about what you mean before you do any clustering whatsoever. Back to my definition, can we be more specific about density-based clustering? So we've hand-waved a definition. Let, let's get something a little more detailed. A cluster is a connecting component of a level set of the probability density function of the underlying and unknown distribution for which our data sample are drawn. What? All right, let's walk through that a little more slowly, get a little bit of intuition going on. That was the data set we've been looking at all day. I can do a sort of a kernel density estimation and, and estimate the probability density function from which that data was drawn. So I've got a heat map over top of that showing denser regions in uh, bluer colors. So that says I'm drawing data from this region, I'm more likely to draw points in the blue areas. All right, so I can cut that into contour sets. These are just areas of equal probability density. Now I can grab one of those contour sets, say all right, that makes a cut. I can look at all the points that fall within one of those lassos or cuts. No problems. There's my clustering. It jives well with my intuition. Does that process a clustering algorithm? Well, there's a couple of problems there that say it might not be a clustering algorithm. We don't know that underlying probability density function that I magically hand waved and showed you a heat map, at, a map of at the beginning. We didn't know which level sets to choose. I and carefully went through those and chose the exact right level set to give you a nice jiving intuition for what that was doing. And the computational complexity of doing either of those tasks is actually quite large. So if I've got a great clustering algorithm that only works on a thousand data points, that might be useful for some applications. But in general, we would like clustering algorithms to be able to scale to very large sc scales, millions of data points and beyond. So what can we do? And to talk about what we can do, practically speaking, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague Leland. There you go. 
Thanks, John. So John handles the statistics and machine learning. Uh, I'm really not in that field as much. I do math and programming. So I'm interested in the practicalities of what we can actually do in practice. So first step, that density approximation. That's a hard thing to do. I don't want to approximate density all across the whole space. That's incredibly computationally expensive. I want to approximate density locally, just around points. So here's what dbscan does. It has two parameters. It has epsilon and min points. And it draws balls of radius epsilon and declares any points that have balls with at least min points in them to be dense. So here I drew a whole bunch of circles of varying of a fixed radius and I colored them red if they had more than three points in them, gray otherwise. So you can see it's picking out the uh, higher density areas there nicely. It found the red dense regions quite well. Okay, that's also very fast to compute and it's sort of local to each point so you can do that fairly efficiently. But let's turn it on its head a little bit. What if we draw circles of whatever radius we need to manage to contain min points, many points. In other words, for each point we're going to take the radius that would be required for dbscan to declare the point dense. So I've done that and I've now shaded those circles with a color according to how large their radius is. The larger the radius, the light, uh, lighter the color, down into sort of greens and yellows. Okay, I can translate that onto the points, and I seem to have colored the points with relatively their relative density. So that's nice. I've got a very cheap estimate of the probability density function over the points. That's great. So now I have to figure out how I can deal with level sets there. So I need to get some level sets and pick out which are the right level sets. So how am I going to do that? The first step to figuring out how to do this is to step back a bit and realize that the level sets are actually going to form a tree. So you can see this a little more clearly with a little animation. So let's get this running. This is, uh, this is a univariate probability density function. And I'm just going to run a line down of decreasing density. And whenever you pick up a new area, I'm going to add a branch to my tree. Whenever I hit a local minima there, I'm going to merge together the branches where they meet until I eventually get a root of the tree. So you can see, given a probability density function, you can build a tree from it. So we can do the same thing with points. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have circles of increasing radius about each point. Remember, the size of the radius is going to be related to how dense the point is. And I'm going to color those circles in as soon as they capture enough points to be declared dense. And then I'm going to merge connected regions together with uh, uniform colors as I go, building up this tree. So here we go. And you can see colors popping up and then merging together. And now we're down to just three colors. Eventually the blue and the purple are going to merge in a minute once they connect up with each other there. And then finally the green pops in and we're at the root of our tree. So we, we can build up a tree of varying density. Okay, if we can get a tree of density, uh, can we play a little game to select out the clusters from that? Yeah, there's, a, there's an excess of mass algorithm that'll select out clusters from a tree. So this is, this is not so bad. Now I can select out the level sets I want. So it's managing to basically pull out the flat clustering from the tree. So what does this look like in practice? So here's our familiar data set. If we run this on this data set, what sort of tree do we get? We get this. Now, that, that is actually a tree. There's actually lots and lots and lots of little branches in there, but it's just solid black because there's so many of them, it's hard to make any sense of it. So we want one more trick here to try and make this a little easier to do. So the trick we're going to play is that in practice, almost all of those splits in this vast complicated tree are one or two points dropping out of a cluster or joining a cluster, depending on which way you want to look at it. And for many purposes, that's, that's not really splitting into two clusters. I don't really think one point is a separate cluster. I have some notion of granularity of how big a cluster could be. I have a, a min cluster size. So as long as I don't lose, as long as the split involves less than that min cluster size number of points falling out, I'm going to say the cluster persists rather than splitting in two. And I just lost some points from that cluster. So if I go through and run that process through on the whole tree, it simplifies the tree down because now most of those splits are not actually splitting apart as a tree. They're just a single cluster losing some points. So if we simplify the tree down, 
This is what we get. Now this is a tree you can actually look at and understand and make sense of, at least reasonably. So our tree is much simpler and the width of each branch is related to the number of points. I've also colored them that way. So you can see that there are points falling out of the clusters as they go down the page. And what you want to do to sort of pick out the flat clustering is effectively maximize the amount of ink. So the, the constraint is that if you choose a cluster, you can't choose any of its children. And so subject to that constraint, you're just going to work through and try and choose the clusters that will basically get you the most amount of ink on the page, so to speak. The excess of mass. So this is what that algorithm picks out as the clusters. Now as it happens, there's a single flat cut there that would actually pick out all of those clusters. But there's actually no reason for that to necessarily be the case. Now, on a different data set, with clusters of wildly varying density, it can pick out something that picks out a cluster way up high in the tree and another cluster way down low in the tree where there's no single flat cut that would get you there. It will handle variable density cuts very nicely. And so what's the result of doing this clustering? Here's what that algorithm provides. And this is what I wanted when I first stared at that data. The black points, again, are noise points. It's considering those outliers. And then the rest, it's picking up the clusters very, very tidily. So this is the HDB scan clustering algorithm. It was very recent from two papers from Campello, Mulavi, and Sander, and Zimic in 2013-2015. And it's an excellent clustering algorithm for just getting things right off the bat. So what about performance? Because that was a nice looking clustering, but we made it at least computable, but how computable is it? How well can we scale out? Well, the first thing is that I don't want to run connected components for every level of that tree. That's too hard to do. That's too expensive. We can frame the problem as connected components in a graph, which improves things a little, but better still, we can find the minimum spanning tree of that graph. Because that minimum spanning tree is literally the edges that cause disconnections of components in the graph. So the minimum spanning tree actually contains all the information to rebuild that cluster tree. So there's a very small number of edges in the graph that are actually the critical ones and we just have to figure out which ones those are and then we can reconstruct the entire tree from that straight away. So the next catch is that the graph we would be doing this on turns out to be a complete graph. So traditional minimum spanning tree algorithms such as prims and cruskles have order n squared asymptotics uh, on a complete graph. They're, they're designed for graphs with relatively small numbers of edges compared to the number of nodes. We're dealing with a graph that has n squared edges where you've got n nodes, so that's not going to cut it. We, we can't really afford an n squared algorithm. So what can we do? We can use spatial indexing. So generally speaking, that's some sort of tree that divides up the space in a sort of recursive manner so that you can ignore effects of things that are a long way apart and only worry about things that are close together. So by that I mean things like quad trees or oct trees, KD trees, ball trees. There's a whole slew of different notions of doing this. Uh, generally we use KD trees and ball trees, uh, but you can think of whatever tree structure uh, for space that you, uh, you prefer to think in. So the main thing that spatial indexing provides is that it's really fast for nearest neighbor queries. If I want to find the nearest neighbor of a point, I can basically run through that tree and ignore all the points that are really far away and only worry about the points that are the closest to that point that I'm querying. And that means I can query for the nearest neighbor of a point in order log n instead of order n. I don't have to look at how far it is away from all the points in the data set, just the ones in, that, in the sort of closest few leaves of the tree. So if we use Borovka's algorithm for minimum spanning trees, the upside of this is that we can actually pretty much turn our minimum speed spanning tree computation into a whole bunch of repeated nearest neighbor queries. There's some caveats on that, but in practice they actually make the algorithm run a little faster. So we can take uh, the dual tree Borovka algorithm that was by March, Ram, and Gray in 2010, 
and we can get order n log n performance from minimum spanning tree computations, which is the bulk of the HDB scan algorithm. So we can convert HDB scan from an n squared algorithm, as it was first published, into an n log n algorithm that we can run in practice. So what does that mean in terms of actual clustering performance? Here's a whole bunch of clustering algorithms, uh, including many of the ones we looked at at the start. And as you can see, they quickly fall into two categories, ones that are actually practicable on reasonable size data sets and the others. So let's worry about the ones that look practicable. We'll extend out the x-axis, look at clustering more points, and there's, there's fewer here. And HDB scan with our n log n implementation is down there in the dark green at the very bottom here. We can extend that out one more time. And now you can see that uh, HDB scan, despite uh, effectively computing DB scan for every possible epsilon parameter value, is running faster than sklearn's db scan. So we can actually do this extremely efficiently and scale to fairly large amounts of data. Now in practice, what can you do? Well, if you're doing it interactively, you know, on the order of 100,000 points, if you want to do it overnight, you can get to 5 million, maybe even 10 million points. Okay, that was good. Can we do better? So. The biggest annoyance that I still have is that I still need to choose this number of points value for the density estimate. How many points do I have to enclose within my epsilon ball before I can declare a point dense? Now, we went from db scan to hdb scan by sort of computing things for all possible epsilon values. So we sort of varied over the whole parameter range and then integrated everything together. Can we play the same trick? Can we vary the min points? parameter the same way we varied epsilon and integrate everything together? Well, no, there's no obvious way to convert that through. But topology to the rescue, said no one till now, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can think of building the initial HDB scan tree in terms of something called persistent homology. If you're familiar with that, great. If you're not, don't panic. It's just a tool from algebraic topology. And the main thing is that it gives us a very clean, simple mathematical description of what's going on. Uh, even better, once we're embracing this topological framework, which we should do anyway, we get other algebraic topology tools to bring to bear on the problem. And one of them is, it's fairly recent, multidimensional persistent homology that came out in about 2008. Uh, that actually lets you do persistent homology over multiple variables. So we could persist over epsilon and min points at the same time. So if we can frame our problem in terms of multidimensional persistent, persistent homology, maybe we can get what we want. The catch is that the result of doing that is not a nice structure like persistent homology gives you where you get a tree. In fact, you get, well, a really complicated thing that's hard to wrap your head around. So our whole little game that we played with the tree to sort of pick out the clusters at the end, that's not available to us anymore. The upside is we can, if you want, completely rethink HDB scan and redescribe it all in terms of sheaves instead of trees. Now, I'm not going to get into sheaves in this talk. Uh, please come chat with me after if you actually care. Uh, and we're getting into some deep theoretical waters here, uh, which I like because I finally get to use all the category theory and topos theory that I learned. So, you know, shout out to Groth and Deke Topologies. I've they're actually finding a practical use in reality. Um, the main thing is that this just gives us the right data structure mentally to solve this problem. The right data structure in practice is probably not going to be this, but that's okay. It's a way to think about the problem. So the, the key is that the resulting algorithm of HDB scan in terms of sheaves does generalize to the multidimensional case. There's some caveats on that because whenever you're generalizing from a simple case up to a more complicated one, you inevitably have the difficulty that there are a couple different ways the generalization could go. That's okay. We all have to figure out the details on that yet. And when we get that done, that's going to be persistent density clustering and we're going to get some advantages here. The main ones are, it's going to be even more robust. There's fewer parameters, you're just going to have to pick the min cluster size. And in practice, we can actually get similar performance. The same asymptotics, the constants are going to be a little worse. Otherwise, all the same. So uh, what are the conclusions and, and what do I want you to take away from this talk? What does John want you to take away from this talk? Well, the first one is k-means should not be your first choice for clustering. We really want to emphasize that. K-means shouldn't be your second choice for clustering either. 
<laughs> the main thing is that we want you to think really hard about what cluster means for your application. What do you need clustering to do? Because that really influences which algorithms make sense for your problem. And while you're thinking about it, you may as well run HDB scan. It's probably what you want to do anyway. <laughs> All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah? What's your take of the curse of dimensionality when you move into higher dimensions? OK, so the, the question was about the curse of dimensionality. And I think uh, the short answer is that I don't think clustering is practical in really high dimensions because I don't think it makes sense. Distances cease to be meaningful, really, uh, in truly high dimensional spaces. So uh, I would say that the answer is that you need a dimension reduction technique before you can cluster. Uh, if your data is living in a high dimensional space, and in a truly high dimensional space, and is natively in that high dimensional space, there isn't some low dimensional manifold that you can pull out. There are no clusters there. There's no meaning there. If your data is in a high dimensional space on a low dimensional manifold, dimension reduction of some form will work, and then you can cluster. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Was it only two dimensional or was it how many dimensional? Oh, uh, ten dimensional data for the timings. Ten dimensional data for the for the timings. Um, uh, we. In practice, I think you can get to 50 or 100 dimensional. It's not too bad. Uh, but HDB scan does scale badly with dimensionality. If you get truly high dimensional data, it's going to take a lot longer to run. That is very true. Uh, yeah? Is the underlying structure now that C code, like, like NumPy, uh, NumPy, or is it? Uh, for, for this code base uh, that uh, is up on the slides here, that you can pip install, cond install, whatever you need, uh, that is all in Cython. So it compiles down to C for the fundamental data structures, yes. Okay. So the question I was leading to is, is this a, is it, so if it goes down to C, does it fundamentally take advantage of the core cores on the system? Or the single core? Uh, it takes advantage. So the question is, does it take advantage of, of, of multi-core? Uh, ultimately, fundamentally, it's single-threaded. It does take advantage of more cores where it can. But uh, the algorithm itself is hard to parallelize well. Uh, that would be an interesting area of research. I'd love to talk to you more if you have thoughts on that. Yeah? So I know you said this persistent density clustering is still forthcoming, but do you kind of have an idea how that might tie into other uses of persistent homology and like topological data analysis, kind of things that have come out already? Is there a sense in which they're related? Uh, yeah, uh, well, Certainly, I, I think I think persistent homology is a really interesting idea that's still trying to find a really really good application. Um, personally, I think this is potentially one of those good applications. Now, I'm not using anywhere near the full power of persistent homology. I'm only interested in the zeroth component, but it's where the tools of persistent homology have realized theoretical value in a practical setting. And I think there are going to be more cases of that, but I think it's going to be Time will tell. Yeah. Uh, what is your recommendation to handle situations when individual dimensions have very varying scales? Modernizations, I mean, what, what would you take on that? Uh, well, that's actually a pretty difficult problem, to be honest. Uh, John, do you have <coughs> thoughts on that? Um, Um, so then you're talking into two dimension reduction techniques. So if you're looking across the set of dimension reduction techniques, how to properly do standardization across your individual variables before collapsing down into space. So there are, I mean, you can always do the standard cent centering and basic statistical techniques. There's some really interesting work coming out of a generalized low rank model paper that came out of Stanford recently with Udell uh, et al, who are talking about the right centering methodology for dealing with heterogeneous data. Um, and I would, I would jump in that direction if you were looking for something sort of cutting edge and uh, experimental. Sounds good.